This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Homestead Journey Podcast. This is episode number 19, or as we like to say around here, step number 19 on our journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. My name is Brian Wells. I'm coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. And when I say beautiful, it is a little bit cold, a little bit windy, and right now I am a little bit sore. Um, I took a little bit of a fall today out on the ice in our driveway. I was working on one of the homestead projects that I've got going on around here that I'm going to share with you in a little bit, and a part of that um, involves some tires from a utility trailer that we have here. And what had happened is the bead broke on those tires just from sitting. And so I had seen on YouTube the videos of people taking brake cleaner or starting fluid and spraying on the inside of tires and then lighting it. And uh, that explosion causes the, uh, the bead to seal and then you can fill it with air. And so I thought, well, I can do that. And uh, so I sprayed the cleaner in there and uh, tried to light the match and turn to run, except that I forgot that right behind me was a patch of ice. And so not only did it not work the first time, but I found myself on my keister in the driveway. Now, thankfully, I uh, did not have the video camera rolling, so... You know, it's not going to be on YouTube or anything like that, but perhaps um, that would be uh, a great video for our YouTube channel. Uh, but eventually that uh, that actually did work by spraying starting fluid in there and actually lighting that match, and bam, um, I was back in business, but back in business with a sore hiney. But you didn't jump onto this podcast to hear about my sore keister, and so Let's jump into this week's Homestead Happenings. I have a lot of things that I want to share with you this week on this segment. Started off actually last Sunday night with a get-together with some local homesteader friends. Uh, We are trying to put together a little bit of a community event uh, here for some homesteaders and like-minded people, and uh, we had hoped to actually have that uh, for this April, but uh, that just didn't quite work out, and so right now we're planning something for mid-July, but it's always a lot of fun to get together with other people who are like-minded individuals, people who are on the journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability, and kind of sharing ideas and getting feedback from people and understanding what's worked for them and maybe sharing some of the things that have worked for us. And it's just always a lot of a lot of fun to get together and talk shop, so to speak, with people. So started out Sunday evening doing that. Then early on in the week, I jumped into a project uh, that I had wanted to do last year, and that is that I have an old trailer here that uh, used to be my dad's. It's an old utility trailer. And I want to turn that into a mobile chicken coop. So if you follow us on Instagram or on Facebook, uh, you will have seen pictures of me digging that out of the snowbank. And uh, I've got that into the uh, garage this week and cut off the old deck. Um, And so actually today I spent the day uh, taking the wheels that were um, the tires that were deflated off of it and uh, replaced it with a spare and then uh, took one of the tires and uh, using the uh, starting fluid, got those tires uh, reinflated. And uh, so now I have good tires on this unit. And I have half of the deck almost done. Um, I still have a few more bolts to put in to hold that down. And then uh, have another two foot section that I need to drop in. And then we can start building some walls. Uh, I also, on the front of it, this is a dump trailer that didn't have a trailer jack on the front. And so I ha- I did go to Harbor Freight this week and got a trailer jack to bolt onto the front of it. 
and that way I'll be able to raise and lower the front and kind of take it on and off the tractor. And so hopefully this will work out well for me. But if you want to kind of follow this build, um, keep an eye on our Instagram, on our Facebook uh, pages, and you'll be able to follow along as I build this mobile chicken coop. This week, I also received some mail, some things that I am very, very excited uh, to try out. First of all, I ordered some things from Haas Tools, and they have uh, some seed starting kits that I was very interested in trying. Now, I have been using Soil Blocker, the Soil Blocker, Elliot Coleman style Soil Blocker for the last several years, and it works well, but I always like to experiment with new things. And so I went ahead and ordered uh, two of the different seed starting kits from Haas Tools. And so on this episode, I'm going to give you my initial impressions of those. And then as I use them, I'll try to keep you up to date with how things go. So the first thing that I ordered was the premium seed starting kit. Now this is the one, and let me just bring it up here. I want to get the exact number. Um, this is the one that has 162 cells in it. So the, and then it comes with the, the cells, it comes with the base, um, it came with some pro mix, the watering wand, and some wooden stakes. I wish I would have ordered it earlier because when they were selling it earlier, they actually, it actually came with some seeds as well, but um, those who uh, snooze lose, and so <laughs> I missed out on some seeds. Um, but anyhow, so my initial impressions on this. Um, first of all, the um, cells are extremely rugged. I think you could drive a Mack truck over this, and it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't give way. Um, the thing that really drew me to this is that inside the cells are ridges and. The idea behind those ridges is that if the roots start kind of swirling around so that you would end up with a root bound um, transplant, they reach that ridge and it causes those roots to have to go down. And so that is really why I wanted to try this out to see if that actually works. I've seen people pull transplants out of this cell and uh, it seems like it works, but I always like to try and see how things work for myself. So very, very well made. The uh, bottom piece as well is, is very well made, um, very rugged. And uh, so I think both of those things are going to last a very, very long time. The one thing that I, I do wish, I guess, with this is I wish that the, the cells fit in the base a little bit better. Um, the, when you put the cells in the base, there's about, uh, I don't know, about a two inch gap on the, on the right side, maybe not quite, maybe an inch and a half gap on the right side and probably about a three inch gap on the end. And so to me, that's a bit of wasted space, especially if you're trying to fit as many of these in a grow light system as possible. Um, in my opinion, it would be nicer if the bottom tray matched up with the size of the cells or the cells were made bigger uh, to fit in the bottom tray. Um, but we'll see how things work out. Maybe there's a method to the badness, but that's just my kind of initial impression on that. The wand looks like uh, it's very well made. Obviously, I haven't hooked it up, haven't used it yet. Looking forward to using this version of ProMix. I've used another version of ProMix before. It worked well for me. So I think all of that's going to be very good. The, the wooden stakes, um, they're nice. I don't know as I would necessarily go out of my way to buy them, simply because I have been using kind of the tongue depressor things, um, and they seem like they're about, these may be a little bit thicker and a little bit longer. Um, it'll be interesting to see how they hold up and see if they last any longer than the tongue depressors. But I can buy 500 tongue depressors for about the same price as these. So we'll, we'll see how they work out. Now, the other thing that I bought from them is I bought the 48 cell seed starting kit. One of the things that I was a bit concerned about with the larger, uh, the premium seed starting kit is that I don't normally start that many seeds at a time. 
Um, that's a lot of seeds to start. And the other piece to it as well is I, when I'm starting seeds, I might start a few, you know, this week, and then I might wait and, and start a few next week of maybe tomatoes, let's say, just because I might want to have, um, especially if they're determinate tomatoes, I might want to have two different crops, shall we say, um, come on. And so, my big concern with this larger unit is, am I going to use it? Am I, am I going to use it all or is it just going to take up a lot of space? Um, and am I going to be able to uh, start maybe some in, let's say, a few rows and then start a few more later on in rows? And how's that going to work with trying to raise the grow lights and all of those kinds of things? So I went ahead and got the 48 uh, cell seed starting kit just to check it out. Now this unit comes um, with a base unit. It comes with the cells and it actually comes with two 24 cell um, units. And then uh, it comes with a lid, a dome. And then it also comes with the, the growing mix and I think it also comes with some markers. Initial impressions on this is that the base isn't quite as rugged as the other one. It doesn't feel quite as rugged. It's still very rugged, but it doesn't feel quite as rugged as the other. The The dome um, is a little, it, it's well made, don't get me wrong, but it's definitely not as heavy duty as the base. And then these cells are a little bit larger than the cells in the, the big unit that I bought. But they don't have the ridges on the inside of the cells. And quite honestly, I'm a little disappointed in that. Um, that is a big part of the reason why I was attracted to the, the Haas Tool seed starting kit. And the fact that these don't have the ridges, I think, are going to lead to plants or transplants becoming root bound. Um, I, I may be wrong, but um, we'll see. I just wish they had those. Also, well, this is definitely far superior as far as the quality than what you would get with other plastic um, seed cells, like the ones that you get at Home Depot or Lowe's, those really chintzy ones. Um, this certainly is not uh, of the same construction as, as the larger unit. Um, it'll be interesting to see how it works out, and also having the dome where the larger unit doesn't have the dome. Um, I'm interested in trying those out. But my initial impressions of the 48 cell uh, seed starting kit um, aren't as, I guess, as good as the larger unit. But we'll see. We'll see. Um, open mind and uh, we'll see how things go. The other thing that I ordered this week um, is I ordered some 10 to 20 trays from Bootstrap Farmer um, because I'm just tired of the chintzy ones that I've been buying. They crack um, and... Uh, Unfortunately, I ordered the wrong ones. I ordered the ones with holes in them, and I wanted the ones without holes in them. So I sent the ones with holes in them back. I have ordered the ones without holes, and when the ones without holes get here, I will do an initial impressions on those. This week, I also placed my order for my turkeys. Unfortunately, I am going to be getting the broad-breasted whites again this year, and that's simply because... Uh, of a timing issue with when I could get the heritage breed turkeys that I wanted. Um, and so I was able to get the broad-breasted whites again. And so I'm going to go that direction and then try to plan a little bit better for next year in going uh, heritage breed with regards to my turkeys. But this this year I am getting the broad-breasted whites. And I'm excited about having turkeys again. We really enjoyed raising the broad-breasted whites, but my goal here on our homestead is to raise as many heritage breed animals as I can. And so, um, you know, not being able to do that with the turkeys this year is a bit of a bummer. But, um, and I may try to work out a few things with regards to perhaps getting some eggs to hatch. Uh, we'll see. Um, but uh, that's the boat we're in. Um, with regards to the turkeys. Now, the other thing is I, I realized, um, and, and, and thankfully I did, I realized that I had forgotten to order speckled Sussex uh, uh, pullets this year. 
Um, and so I, I went to the, um, when I, when I filled out the order form at the local feed store at Country Power Products, I, uh, did it basically from memory. And I went through, I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, I think I've added up, I think that's enough. And, uh, then I was talking to a friend of mine at work and, man, did I order those speckled Sussex? And so I went down, uh, at lunch and asked, um, the lady there, whether or not I had ordered them, she said, no, you didn't. And so thankfully she was able to get them on the order and they are on the way. The last thing I want to share with you on today's Homestead Happenings, and I told you it was going to be a long segment, <laughs> is that we had the opportunity today to go to a presentation at our local library on modern homesteading. And it was very, very enjoyable uh, first of all, to sit there and to um, hear from somebody in our community who is a modern homesteader. Um, I had been following her page on Facebook. I don't know her personally. I just met her today. Um, but it was very refreshing, I guess, and very encouraging to hear somebody else who has a very similar perspective um, with regards to modern homesteading and, and kind of the broad tent that homesteading can be. And the other thing that was very, very encouraging is it was a standing room only crowd there today. They filled up that meeting room and it was just standing room only. And so it was very um, encouraging to see that many people in our, in our area who are interested in homesteading. And there was nobody else there that I knew. Um, there's one guy that I have met previously, but I don't know him um, well. Uh, but other than that, there was nobody else there that I knew. It was all fresh faces. And I had the opportunity to interact with a few people. And uh, so, you know, for me, going to an event like that is as much about community and connections and relationship as it is about knowledge. And uh, so I, I got some great tidbits and tricks from her, uh, a, a website that I want to check out with regards to uh, gardening. So um, it was definitely well worth my time and it was very, very encouraging. All right, that is it for this week's Homestead Happenings. Let's jump on over to charting the course. This week's Charting the Course is going to be part four, and it's going to be the last uh, of our series with regards to raising chickens. Now, I had hoped to have a part five, which is going to be or was going to be an interview with a small hatchery out of California. Unfortunately, we're having a bit of an issue getting um, that coordinated. Still planning on doing it. Uh, they just asked if we could push it out until April because right now they're just very, very busy, busy time of the year for them. And uh, I was definitely glad to accommodate that request. Looking forward so much to uh, talking chickens with them. And I think it's going to be a really, really great time, a really great episode. Uh, and so still planning on doing it, but it's just not going to be a part of this series with regards to raising chickens. So on today's episode, we are going to talk about seven mistakes people make or misconceptions people have about raising chickens. So let's jump right into it. Number one, a rooster is required in order to get eggs. Now this is something that uh, I get asked, I wouldn't say frequently, but fairly often from people who I run into who find out that I have chickens, especially when we are volunteering at the poultry barn at the fair. Um, people will ask us whether or not you have to have a rooster in order to keep hens and to have eggs. Um, and I understand if you uh, have never been around chickens, I can understand why people might have that uh, misconception in the back of their minds. But folks, you do not have to keep a rooster in order to get eggs. And it's not that big of a deal that people have that misconception, except for the fact that I think for some people, they may end up not getting chickens because they think that they have to have a rooster in order to have eggs. And maybe they live in an area where you're not allowed to have roosters, or they're trying to be good neighbors, and they're afraid that if they got a rooster and it was crowing, it would upset their neighbors, and they don't want to do that. 
Or maybe they're just afraid of roosters. They've heard the horror stories of aggressive roosters attacking people. And, uh, and so they think you have to have a rooster in order to get eggs so they don't get chickens. But folks, you don't have to have a rooster in order to get eggs. Your ladies will lay just fine if there's no boy around. Number two, your coop must be insulated and winterized. I see people make this mistake, unfortunately, far too frequently. Um, in the fall, as it's starting to get, you know, we're heading into colder months, maybe October, November, I see people putting up plastic around their runs um, or when they're building a chicken coop thinking they need to put insulation on the inside of it, thinking they need to make their coops weather tight. And, and folks, that is absolutely one of the worst things you can do for your chickens. A chicken coop needs to have proper ventilation. It needs to have good ventilation. And in part, that's because, as I've shared before, that chickens don't urinate. So the way that they relieve themselves of excess water is through their feces and through their breathing, through the respiration. And so if you have a coop that is weather tight, there is no, no place for that moist air to go. And what that does is it creates an environment in your coop where pathogens and bacteria can multiply. That's not good for your ladies. That's not good for you. So you do not need to winterize or weatherize your coop. In fact, like I said, I think it's one of the worst things you can do. Your coop needs to be draft free. That's absolutely 100% correct. But make sure you have very, very good ventilation uh, in order to not have those moist conditions where bacteria and pathogens can multiply. Number three, your coop must be heated in the winter. If you take number three and combine it with number two, in my opinion, that's about the worst thing you can do for your chickens. And it's about the worst thing you can do for you. Because now what you have done, if you have a weather tight coop and you add a heat lamp, you have just created a chicken sauna. And now, not only do you have a moist condition in your coop because of all of the things that we've mentioned, but you have a warm, moist condition. You have a humid condition in your coop. And again, that's just optimal um, environments for the bacteria and pathogens and so forth to multiply. But not only is that an environment that is going to be conducive to bacteria and pathogens multiplying, it also is a situation where if you have a run that's maybe unheated that your chickens can go out into, they go from that warm, moist air out into that cold run, and that is a recipe for frostbite on their combs and on their waddles. So again, I, I just think it's really, really a bad idea to have a heated coop. Um, but beyond that, people generally will use a heat lamp as their means to heat their coop. And heat lamps, are, heat lamps, not heat lamps, heat lamps are very, very dangerous. And in fact, many, many structural fires on farms are caused as a result of heat lamps. I do not like to use heat lamps. I use them in my brooder. I will use them in the winter if I have an oops litter with my pigs. If I have a sick animal that needs to be kept warm, I might use a heat lamp, but I try not to use heat lamps as much as possible. Uh, and folks, it's just very, very unnecessary. It's very dangerous. And I think it just creates an environment in your coop that's bad for your ladies and it's bad for you. So to me, the risk certainly outweighs the reward. Uh, do not use heat lamps or heat in your coops in the winter. Your ladies are well insulated with the feathers that God gave them, and they will be okay. And especially if you have a lot of birds, they're going to huddle together. They're going to create warmth uh, with each other. And so the heat lamps are not needed. Number four, chickens need sweaters. <laughs> Periodically throughout the year, I will be tagged probably at least a half a dozen times every year uh, in pictures or people will share pictures on my Facebook page of the knitted chicken sweaters that chicken mamas 
um, with a little bit too much time on their hands make for their chickens. I think my understanding why people do that is because they're trying to keep their chickens warm. Again, people, your chickens are going to be okay. They've got plenty of feathers. They're going to be okay. But be, besides the fact that they don't need them, in my opinion, I think it's really bad for your chickens. You see, your chickens, in order to keep themselves clean, are going to dust bathe. They get down in the dirt, and you, you, you'll see them. Um, they, they're tossing dirt all over themselves. And the reason they do that is that, again, that's how they clean themselves, but it helps get mites and all of those things that are causing them to be itchy off of them. Well, if they have a chicken sweater on, then they can't properly dust bathe. And so now you've created an environment that's really bad for your chickens because you're tra trapping those mites and whatnot onto, uh, onto them. And, uh, and they can't properly dust bathe. So they don't need chicken sweaters. Uh, they may look cute, um, but please don't do it. And really, along with that are chicken saddles. I do not like chicken saddles. Now, a chicken saddle is not quite as extreme as far as covering up your chicken as, as a sweater would be. But a chicken saddle is a piece of cloth that people will put over the backs of their chickens because if you ever watch a rooster mate with a hen, it is a rather violent um, situation. They kind of grab them, they get on their backs um, with their, their talons and they kind of, well, they do their thing. And then they'll kind of shake their feathers off and, and, and move on. And if uh, a rooster likes a particular hen a whole heck of a lot, they'll work them so much that they'll tear the the feathers out of the back of their heads and they will eventually potentially tear the feathers off the back of the chicken. And if that chicken starts, that hen starts to bleed, the other hens will start pecking them and can peck them to death. And so in part, people will put the chicken saddles on them as a way to protect the, the um, hens from getting their back feathers pulled out. And also they will do that if there's a, an injured hen to keep the other hens from pecking them. Again, I don't like this. Um, I don't like it because it does, in my opinion, it gets in the way of the chickens being able to provide proper hygiene for themselves. Um, if they have that chicken saddle on, it's going to trap those mites and whatnot underneath their back, uh, on their back. Um, they're not going to be able to get the dust up underneath there like they would want to. But beyond that, if you have an injured hen, in my opinion, the best thing to do is to separate her from the flock. And that's what we do here. If we see a hen that's bleeding, um, we just separate them. We have a couple of dog kennels that we keep on hand for those purposes. And we just give them their little dog kennel for a few days until they're okay. Um, if you're concerned about you know your, your chickens being beat up by the rooster, then segregate the rooster or don't have a rooster. Um, but again, I just don't like chicken saddles. I think they're, they do more harm than they do good. And uh, definitely chickens don't need sweaters. In my opinion, they don't need saddles either. Number five, chickens don't lay in the winter. Now there is some truth to this, but there's also some misconceptions here. If you get chicks in the spring, those pullets, generally speaking, will start laying in the fall. And their first year, they will lay right through the winter. It's in their second year and their third year that they're going to molt. And when they molt, that means they lose their feathers and they grow out new feathers. During that time period, they may slow down or stop altogether, uh, laying altogether. During that second winter, they will also slow down and they may stop laying altogether. For sure, during the third winter, you'll almost see no eggs. And as they age, you will just see that go for longer and longer and longer periods of time. But during their first winter, they will lay right through. They may not be as prolific as they are during the summer or the, you know, the spring, summer, and the fall, but they certainly will lay eggs all the way through. And so that's a big part of the reason why we cycle our flock out every year because I am not feeding hens through the winter who aren't laying eggs. Now, you certainly can add lights to your coop. 
uh, so that they have long, at least you're tricking them into having longer daylight hours and that can help with egg production. But this idea that chickens do not lay during the winter is an absolute misconception. They may slow down. As they age, they may stop laying. But during that first year, they generally speaking will lay right through the winter. And if you add artificial light, that will also help them to lay in the winter during subsequent years. Number six, eggs must be washed. Folks, I don't understand why we do this in the United States of America. Well, I do understand why, but I think it's still foolish. Um, I think we are the only developed nation and even undeveloped nations or third world countries, depending on, I don't know, however you look at it. Uh, they don't wash their eggs. If you go to Europe, you're going to find eggs in the aisle at the supermarket. They are not in a cooler in the dairy section. You're going to find them out in the aisle. When we lived in Brazil, we would go to the farmer's market and they would have stacks of eggs out in the blazing hot tropical sun. I never heard of anybody getting sick off of eating eggs. If eggs are properly cared for, they... Now, I'm not necessarily recommending that you leave them in your hot car or that you leave them for an extended period of time out in the hot sun, okay? But if you keep them in semi-cool conditions, controlled in a controlled environment, and eggs are properly cared for, they're not going to go bad. You see, when an egg is laid, the hen secretes something that's called the bloom. And if you watch an egg or you see an egg right after it's laid, it's actually wet on the outside. And then that, that secretion dries on the outside of the egg and it offers protection to the egg to keep bacteria and so forth from penetrating the shell. For some reason in the United States, we think that we're smarter than God. And so we wash that bloom off and then put them in the fridge. Well, that's really what causes eggs to go bad more quickly because now you've taken that protective covering off of that egg and you have now shortened its lifespan. And the only way to extend its lifespan is to refrigerate it which then takes up space in your fridge and it also requires energy. If eggs are clean and left unwashed, you can safely leave them out on your countertop. You can store them in egg cartons in your basement, whatever you want to do with them. They do not need to be refrigerated. However, once an egg has been refrigerated, whether it's washed or unwashed, then it should always be refrigerated. Um, and if an egg has been washed, then it always should be refrigerated. But eggs do not need to be refrigerated in order to be stored. Number seven, there is one right way to keep chickens. Besides the GMO slash organic debate, I'm not sure there is another topic in homesteading that people get as dogmatic and as passionate about as raising chickens. People will be very dogmatic that you have to free range your chickens or you have to keep them on pasture or you, you know, whatever. Um, people get very, very dogmatic um, and are very passionate about certain chicken keeping systems. And while I understand all of that, I certainly do not think that there is one right way to keep chickens. In fact, we've talked about that. I don't want to just keep harping on that. Uh, we've talked about that multiple times on this podcast. Um, but what works on one homestead may not work on another. And there may be reasons why somebody can't or doesn't want to free range their chickens. In fact, at the uh, presentation that we were taught or that I went to today, uh, the lady was sharing uh, how she free ranges her chickens now, but the house that they used to live at before they bought this house about four years ago, um, they couldn't free range their chickens. And that was because they had a smaller piece of property and their garden was right next to where the chickens were. And if you know anything about chickens, chickens can mow down a garden in no time at all. 
And so if you want to free range your chickens, then you're going to have to protect your garden or you can't free range your chickens. Uh, and in fact, somebody, because she was saying how she free ranges her chickens now, uh, and she also has very large gardens, actually has a, a small CSA, uh, somebody said, well, how do you keep your chickens out of your garden? And come to find out it was a location thing. Their chickens are located on one side of the road. Their gardens are located on the other side of the road. And the chickens don't have a tendency or their chickens don't have a tendency to cross the road. I know we can make all kinds of why did the chicken cross the road jokes here, but we won't. But the point is, is that for them, that system works. For me, I've chosen not to allow my chickens to free range because A, I don't like to step in fresh chicken manure uh, and chickens will poop anywhere and everywhere and it's just kind of nasty. Um, but B, we have a lot of predators and we're um, fairly close to a major road. And so for those reasons, I want to protect my chickens and so I keep them in a large run. So there is no right way to raise chickens. I think there are principles that you should follow. There are good things um, that you, you know, things that your chickens need. But as far as a chicken system, uh, find a system that works for you and uh, have fun. Raise those chickens. All right, that brings us to the end of our series with regards to chickens. If there are questions you have with regards to raising chickens that I did not answer, you can always reach out to me via email the Homestead Journey Podcast at gmail.com. You can contact us on our Instagram site or our Facebook page. More than happy to help you out. And depending on the questions, I may share them on the podcast so that other people can benefit from them. If there are some myths or misconceptions that I didn't think of, let me know that as well. And if you disagree with my assessments, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, I'm always trying to learn. And so maybe there's something that uh, you know that I don't, something that you've thought of that I haven't. And uh, so maybe what I think is a myth or a, myth, a misconception or a mistake, maybe it isn't. Uh, and so I would absolutely love to hear from you. But folks, that's it for this episode. As always, the music on this episode is provided by Audionautics.com. A big shout out to them. Thank you very much. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.